On this episode of The Anxious Truth, we're going to talk about why recovery is just so damn hard to do. We know that it's hard to do, but today we're going to find out why. So let's get going. Welcome back, everybody. This is The Anxious Truth Podcast, episode number 190, recorded in January of 2022. If you are new here, I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of this fine podcast. The Anxious Truth is the podcast that talks about all things anxiety and anxiety recovery. So if you are struggling with things like panic attacks, panic disorder, or agoraphobia, this is the place for you. I'm happy that you are here. If you are a returning listener or a longtime listener, thank you for coming back. I appreciate your time and attention as always. Today, we're going to talk about why the recovery process is so damn hard. We know that it's really hard to engineer productive recovery from things like panic disorder or agoraphobia or OCD. It's difficult. This is hard, scary kind of work. We know this. We, we acknowledge it on every podcast episode, every day, all the time. Why is it so hard? Today, we're going to talk about why it's so hard. Now, before we do that, I'm just going to remind you of a new project that I have going on called The Anxious Morning, which is a daily anxiety support email newsletter that shows up in your inbox when you wake up every morning, unless you're in Australia or New Zealand, in which case it's the afternoon. Sorry about that. But uh, the anxious morning will show up in your inbox every morning. It is a quick three to 500 word email with an anxiety recovery lesson or some something to think about, something to chew on, something to maybe turn you in a different direction, a little closer to recovery and a little further from fear. And there's also a little podcast episode that goes with it, a little three to five minute podcast episode. So if you want to check that out, just go to theanxiousmorning.com. You can sign up for the email. It's free. You can listen to the podcast and all of your favorite podcast platforms. Check it out. We're about two weeks into it. Everybody's digging it so far. So if you have not subscribed already to the Anxious Morning email list, go do that now at theanxiousmorning.com or theanxiousmorning.email. Okay, so let's get into this week's episode. Why on earth is recovery so freaking hard to do? We know that it is. That's not a question. We know that this is hard, and I, and I acknowledge it all the time, right? This is hard stuff. We're doing intentionally doing difficult, scary things in order to get better on the long term. Why is it so, so hard? hard? Now, now, a, a lot, lot of times, times the, the fact that it is such a difficult process to go through and can be such a struggle will lead some people to believe that I know what I'm supposed to do because in the end, recovery always comes down to, well, I know what I'm supposed to do. If you're listening to the podcast or you read my books or you follow anybody who sounds like me, Claire Weeks or, or any other social media people that talk like I do about this, invariably you wind up in a place where you say, well, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I just can't seem to bring myself to do it. I just can't do it consistently. And I get that. I say all the time that this is a very simple plan, but it's really hard to execute. I'm not going to deny that. This is a simple plan. But the execution is difficult because it requires us to do scary and hard things. And sometimes it leads people to start to conclude like, well, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I just can't do it. Does that mean I'm worse than everybody else? Or does that mean that I'm broken or there's something extra wrong with me or I'm just too weak to do this? And no, it doesn't mean that at all. I promise it doesn't mean that. So let's take a look at why anxiety recovery is so hard. Let's really kind of break it down. So I'm going to give you, there's a lot of different reasons that come together to make this a difficult thing to do. But I'm going to look at what today we're going to call sort of the big two. These are the primary two reasons why this is such a difficult process. And the fact that it's difficult doesn't make it impossible. Let me say that right up front. I'll wrap up with that also. But it doesn't make it impossible. But it helps to know why the challenges are what they are and why this is so difficult. Uh, understanding some of these concepts really can help you sort of avoid that trap of thinking that you're broken or you're, you're extra ill or you're too weak to do this. So the first of the big two reasons why anxiety recovery is such a difficult task is that humans just hate to be afraid and, un and uncomfortable. We're not wired that way. I mean, I'm not telling you anything, you know, this is not anything you don't already know, right? So we hate, humans hate to be afraid and uncomfortable. But the bad news is that effective requ recovery requires that we intentionally get afraid and uncomfortable over and over and over. So yeah, that's going to make it really hard to do. Now, look, there are people out there that are sort of adrenaline junkies. They're the outliers. They love to be afraid. They love to be truly uncomfortable. But that is not the majority of people. We know that they exist sort of on the fringes. And that's fine. God bless them. Like, more power to them. But for most of us, we don't want to feel that way. Now, I'm not saying that humans are fragile. We're not breakable. We're not, we're not you know, dainty. We're not at all. We don't want to be afraid or uncomfortable. But in the end... We are really capable of handling those things. And recovery is about learning that and uncovering that part of us, right? So we don't want to be afraid or uncomfortable. We will do everything we can to avoid going into those situations, not because we can't handle them, 
we are incredibly strong and we are incredibly resilient and we are incredibly resourceful and we can handle all of those things. We just choose to not do them. Like we really reserve that stuff, like those those displays of courage and bravery for when we absolutely have no choice and we have to do it. If our lives depended on it, then we will go ahead and, and exhibit that bravery and exhibit that that strength and resiliency and resourcefulness. But until our lives depend on it, we would tend to try to avoid situations that will make us uncomfortable or afraid. And when we do go into those situations, when we're forced into them, we prefer, generally speaking, to run as opposed to fight. So if you look at this as fight or flight, flight kind of wins most of the time. So we don't want to be in those situations because we don't like to be afraid and uncomfortable. And when we do get into them, we would tend to fly, flee or run before we fight, uh, probably because flight is a better option survival-wise most of the time. I'm guessing from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, flight kind of takes priority because we have a better chance of surviving and, you know, coming back another day if we run as opposed to turning and fighting. So, you know, intentionally going into these uncomfortable and scary situations and difficult situations again and again repeatedly as a means to get better just runs counter to our normal grain. Like we're going against the grain here, generally speaking, for most of us. So that's the first and foremost reason. It doesn't mean that you're weak or you can't do it. It just means that nobody wants to do this, right? So nobody wants to do it this way. So always keep that in mind. You're asking yourself to do something that is generally not part of human nature. We don't really want to do it. Here is the second reason. And this is one that I think we're going to get into a little bit of mechanics here of habit building and why this matters. This may help you understand a little more as to like, oh, yeah, this is why I'm having such a hard time doing it. Like I'm broken. This is why. So recovery experiences, the experiences that we need to have to move toward recovery, right? We need to go into these scary situations. We need to go into these uncomfortable situations. We need to surrender to the fear, willfully tolerate, accept, float, whatever your favorite words are that you like to use. I like surrender. But we have to go into those situations and give ourselves up to these feelings. I'm going to willfully accept and tolerate that I'm going to be afraid. I'm going to be uncomfortable. We move through those situations so that we can learn that we can handle them. We can tolerate them, right? We need to uncover that brave, resourceful, courageous, like resilient part of us that, that we don't think exists. And we, so we have those experiences, but they're not pleasant experiences, right? So recovery experiences, when you look at that, going and do your exposures and meeting your challenges, they are not very conducive to habit forming. Now, in the last podcast episode, episode number 189, so if you go to theanxioustruth.com slash 189, you can listen to that. I talked about how really recovery, it's not swift, it's not sudden, it's not dramatic. It doesn't happen in big chunks. Recovery is really about habit forming. Recovery is about dropping your old avoidance and escape habits and building new recovery focused habits. So in order to really get better, we build these series of small recovery focused habits, and we, we stack them on top of each other. And we practice them again and again and again. And over time, they make a difference, right? So that's what recovery looks like. Recovery is really a series of killing old habits that are based on avoidance and escape and building new habits and practicing them and stacking them on top of each other. So recovery is really about habit forming and recovery experiences are not in any way conducive to forming habits. They are conducive to forming habits, just the wrong habits in the wrong way. So let's take a look at this. When we compare experiences that build strong habits and experiences that help us toward recovery, they're kind of polar opposites. Right, recovery experiences mean being afraid and uncomfortable on purpose, and really those are things that would inhibit or block the the habit formation process. Like we don't want to repeat negative experiences. We hate forming do that doing those things. We don't want to do them to begin with, and we sure as hell don't want to repeat them. So it's really hard to turn things that make us uncomfortable into habits that we repeat and practice and stack on top of each other to get to recovery. Right. When we do our exposures and we meet our recovery challenges, the result is discomfort and fear. It's not an, an instant relief. We don't learn to make it go away. We say it all the time. You don't do your exposures to not be anxious. You do your exposures to intentionally be anxious. So it's not really good. You know, we're going we're gonna to go into these situations that we're going to intentionally feel bad when we do these things. And that really isn't a thing that we are bred and you normally want to repeat so these are not good experiences that make us want to form these good habits. It's the opposite. See where I'm heading with this. So let's talk about the book Atomic Habits. Now, a, a, a zillion people have read Atomic Habits. If you haven't read it, that's okay. You can go check it out if you want. 
And I decided I'm going to read this book because it's so incredibly popular and I see what the, what the, what the fuss is. And, and it's, it's a good, good book. book. Don't, Don't get me wrong. wrong. Like James, James Clear wrote, wrote the, the book, book and it's a great book. I get it. There's a lot of good stuff in there. But some people, I've heard people bring it to me and say, oh, so much of this kind of reminds me of Atomic Habits. And the reason why I want to talk about Atomic Habits in this part of the podcast where we're talking about how hard recovery is, is because it is a good book, but you can't really use it as a recovery book or a recovery guide unless you really understand how the things that James Clear is writing about are opposite of what makes good recovery, right? So in Atomic Habits, he, he kind of breaks it down pretty well. Now, there's some kind of old school behaviorism in there. So, eh, okay, maybe it's a little dated, but I get it what he's, what he's talking about. It's pretty good stuff. So he talks about um, habits as just repetitive problem-solving routines, right? We, we learn to solve our problems by, by finding what works, and then we repeat those things. And he calls, he breaks it down into four things, cues, cravings, responses, and rewards. So in those models, in that model, we form productive habits that create positive processes and then for positive outcomes when we can easily see that we know what our craving is. We have a craving. We can easily see clear cues around us that tell us how to act in such a way that will satisfy the craving. Then we respond, we act that way, and then we get it. We get a reward. So let's look at a, hab a simple habit building example that I kind of put together just for this podcast really quickly. So for example, I have a headache and I want it to go away. That would be my craving. I want to get rid of my headache. I know there's a bottle of aspirin in my medicine cabinet because I bought it. And I know that aspirin will help my headache. That's a cue. So I, I have a headache. I want to get rid of it. That's my craving. The cue is I know that I see aspirin in my medicine cabinet. I know it's there. I know aspirin is good for headache. The response is I take the aspirin. And the result is the headache goes away, which is my reward. I've satisfied the craving, right? So a very simplistic model here, but it kind of matters. It does matter. So I had a craving to get rid of my headache. I know the cue was right there. I have aspirin in the medicine cabinet. I know it's good for headache. I take it. That's my response. And my headache goes away. That's my reward. So that's really simple. It's easy to understand. The sequence is easy to interact with, and it produces an immediate reward for me. So I can really quickly form a habit, a, an aspirin-taking habit when it comes to solving the headache problem. Right? So if I have a headache down the road, my habit is, well, I'll take an aspirin because it worked so well and it was an easy habit to form. Now, let's kind of compare that to the recovery process. So in the recovery process, let's say that your craving is to make your anxiety go away. I panic because I am afraid to be afraid. I panic over panicking, right? Um, I want the panic and anxiety to go away. That's my craving. Here's, the, here's where it starts to fall down and where our situation really becomes almost opposite. Where's the cue here? What in the environment tells us how to make that happen? Nothing. We, when we are in that situation and we get really sensitized, we're on a hair trigger for anxiety and panic. Everything we think, everything we feel, everything around us, all the stimulus can become triggers. So I know that I have a craving to make my anxiety go away, but all I see around me are triggers that, that make it worse again and again and again. I don't see any clear cue here that says, oh, if I do this, I know this will work. So I, I just start trying to avoid the triggers. That's one thing that I try to do because all I see is triggers. I don't really see cues to solving the problem. I see triggers to be avoided. And then I just start throwing every piece of crap that I can think of at it. So I throw my essential oils and my, my weighted blankets and my meds, and, and I throw everything at it that I think will help. But I'm randomly throwing stuff at, hoping that something works. So one of the clear, one of the things that makes habit building easy is clear cues. We can see what to do to solve our, our problem, to satisfy our craving, right? In this situation, there are no clear cues to see. All we see is triggers to avoid, and then we just try random things. We scroll endlessly through Instagram looking for anxiety gurus who will tell us how to make it go away. Eh, doesn't really work. So my response essentially is like, well, I'm just going to sort of try to avoid everything here. I'm going to run from it. I'm going to try to avoid the triggers. I'm going to try and stop it from happening. When it does happen, I'm going to throw all kinds of random stuff at it. And, I, you know, my reward may be, if I get any reward whatsoever, it would be temporary relief. I'm okay as long as I sniff my lavender oil and I calm down for, for an hour or pretend I don't know what's going to happen in the next hour. So the only habit that possibly get formed, there's a clear craving, I want to make this go away, but there are no clear cues. The response is essentially not bringing that, that, that craving satisfaction about. So we're, we're randomly responding, we're avoiding the triggers to make it worse, and we're randomly throwing out the problem, and so we don't really get a reward. Or when we get a reward, eh, it's, it's temporary, it's fleeting. 
Like if, if those things were working for you, you would not be listening to this podcast right now. So what winds up happening here is we don't have any clear way to build habits. And if we do build a habit in that situation, the habit that we build is based on that fleeting temporary sort of low level reward of temporary uh, easing of our of our distress. So we build avoidance habits. So the recovery is sort of the anxiety situation is built so that it encourages the avoidance and the the escape habits that glue us to the disorders. See the problem here. This is this is a big issue. And this is why it is so difficult. Not only do we just not like to do scary things, which is clear, but we also can't seem to get on track to form the habits that will lead us to recovery because the context that we're in actually discourages the formation of those habits. It, it discourages. It actually encourages the formation of avoidance and escape habits that keep us stuck. So you're not broken. You're just following some basic behavioral rules that human beings do. Now, let's kind of move on this a little bit. When we are in that situation, one of the things that we have to do here, let's let's go through this. Let's go through James Clear's craving, cue, response, reward thing, right? So to build habits, recovery habits. The craving is, is pretty clear, right? So that's not an issue. Like we know that we're having anxiety attacks, we're having panic attacks, I'm having intrusive and obsessive thoughts. I get that. The craving is I want to make this go away. But the cues are hidden to us. Imagine the first time you ever read a Claire Weeks book or the first time you stumbled upon the Anxious Truth podcast and you heard this crazy guy with a microphone in New York telling you you have to go toward your fear. Like, oh, no, we don't avoid anything. We don't avoid triggers. We intentionally practice being anxious. You would think this guy's crazy. And a lot of people do that. The first time you ever hear that, it's incredibly counterintuitive. You don't think that at all. You're looking for comfort. You're trying to make it go away. But the people who are telling you the way out of this, almost invariably, when you hear people like me, good therapists, behavioral therapists who treat anxiety disorders, all the different books, the best books that are written out there, will all tell you, you got to go toward it and move through it. That is not a clear cue. You would never have thought of that. You can't see that cue that points you toward your craving solution. So we need to use the big old human parts of our brain to look for the hidden cues. They're not there in front of us. We have to find them. And that comes in the form of psychoeducation from people like me that's, that will tell you, like, I know you want to make it go away, but you can't. You have to stop making it try to go away. You got to go toward it and move through it. So we're having a hard time there. You have to actually use some extra reasoning f faculties and facilities in your brain to uncover cues to recovery that you wouldn't normally see because they're not apparent and they're not intuitive. So that's a problem. Oh. And in, in the, the response, response phase, phase, the action that you will take. So let's say that you've been listening to this podcast or you read my book, The Anxious Truth or, or whatever, you know, you're, you're, you're learning, you've learned and you, you get it now. Okay, guys, I get it. I know what I have to do. I know what I have to do for recovery. So now you get it and you've, you've gotten to the point where you can see the cues. Uh, the cue is I got to move when I have fear. That's a cue, but I have to move toward it, not try and banish it. Okay, so you got that part down. The response, what is my response? What's my action that I take to try and move toward the, the satisfaction of my craving, the, the solving of my problem? Well, in the response phase, recovery-focused actions, the thing we talk about all the time, what I write about and speak about, those are hard. It's hard to go toward the fear and tolerate it, surrender to it, all of that stuff, move through it. Avoidance-focused actions are a whole lot easier to do, right? So going toward fear, not so great. You know, running away from fear, well, that's a whole lot easier to do, and it might actually bring you some temporary fleeting relief. So which response is the one that you're going to pick, right? The easy stuff builds habits. The hard stuff does not, except the easy stuff builds maladaptive habits that keep us glued to the disorder. So we got a problem in that phase, too. And then when it comes down to the reward phase, we are in a situation where after we take our recovery-focused actions, you go and do your exposure, you do your ERP work, you do all that stuff, you allow what you're feeling, you stop trying to solve it, you just try to move through it the best you can, you will feel uncomfortable. The, the result there is that you will feel bad. You won't feel good. So there's actually no reward to be had there in the immediate thing. So right immediately, you're not going to feel much of a reward. So you have to, again, use that like, that human faculty that, that we have, because we have very big brains, we have to look into the future to find the reward. So we're literally trying to find, you know, a reward down the road. Because there's no reward right now. When you do your exposure, I mean, if you can keep your eyes focused on the prize down the road, 
I mean, we're, we're going to talk about that in other podcast episodes, the process as opposed to the outcome. We're going to talk about all that stuff. But right now, if you can say, well, I'm doing this for a reason. I understand why I'm doing it. This is a process I have to follow. And the outcome is down the road, not today. If you can keep your eye on that, okay, I did it. Nothing bad happened to me. I can learn from this. That's your reward. But that's not nearly as powerful a reward as I took a, a Xanax and my anxiety went away much more powerful reward there. So you're more likely to develop that habit than the recovery focus habit, right? So when you think about this, it sort of sucks because when you want to form good habits, you wear in a context in, in a state of disordered anxiety where the situation, the context is not conducive to forming good recovery habits. We really got to work on that. We have to look down the road. We have to uncover things that aren't intuitive. We have to do the opposite. We got to think outside the box. We have to accept long-term goals, long-term rewards, not immediate rewards. So again, I'm going to do a quick quote from the, the show notes on the podcast here. If you want to go to the show notes, it's the slash 190. Basically, I say, why then is forming good reha recovery habits and therefore the whole process of recovery so difficult? Because everything about the process requires that we look past the obvious and automatically condition things. We must infer and compute cues to action that are not obvious to us and go against our natural grain. We must look to future, sometimes long-delayed rewards. We don't get to hit a lever and get a food pellet like rats in a lab. We have to find difficult activities that we can't see, then do them to get delayed rewards that we can't feel. This is what it takes to, good, to develop good recovery habits, and none of that is easy. So to understand why recovery is so hard, we don't want to do this and that we have to start to form recovery habits, and nothing about this is conducive to the way humans form habits naturally and effectively. We got to really look ahead. We got to really use some extra human juice that's up in our big old brains to look past the immediate and the obvious and look down the road and embrace long-term goals. It sucks. So in the end, it's hard to build recovery-focused habits because we're asking you to trade short-term discomfort, no reward for a long-term gain, reward that you can't see right now and you can't feel right now and you just have to trust is going to come one day. That does not make it easy to continually do exposures and do your ERP and go toward the fear and accept and stop fighting. It does not make it easy at all, right? It does not make it easy at all. So I want to wrap up by just kind of reminding you that it's really common when you struggle, if you don't keep all of this in mind, I know I threw a lot at you in this episode, but if you don't keep all this in mind, it can be really easy to say, I am just broken. I'm never going to be able to get this. Why can't I get this? People ask all the time, why? I don't understand why I can't get it. Well, you do get it, but it, you're not broken or too weak. You're just like delightfully normal in your humanness. Like recovery, so much of recovery is going against the grain of what we would normally do in our day-to-day non-anxious lives. It is counterintuitive. It's opposite action. We hear about opposite action all the time in recovery. That's actually a thing. Taking opposite action, going against the grain, looking for the long term instead of the short term. None of that is easy. None of it is easy because it just goes against what we're sort of conditioned to do on autopilot. So recovery doesn't work on autopilot. Avoidance works on autopilot. Recovery is really active and it requires us to continually, continually come back to these concepts and remind ourselves why we're doing this. That's right. I know why I'm doing this. I know why I'm doing this. I know why this is so hard. I know why it's a struggle, but I understand why I'm choosing to struggle. All right. So keep this stuff in mind. This is the big two reasons why I think recovery that explains why recovery is so hard. It has nothing to do with you being worse than everybody else or too weak or more broken. It doesn't. It just has to do with the fact that this has nothing to do with the way we've been involved to sort of solve problems. We are solving problems a completely unorthodox way in recovery, but it's incredibly rewarding. And just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's impossible. There are people in this community surrounding this podcast, the anxiety community online, that are in the process and making it work every day. People have been through it, come out the other side. So it, difficult does not mean impossible. You could do it. Just remember everything that you're hearing today. File it away. Come back to this episode when you have to as a reminder that you're not broken. It doesn't mean that you're broken. Let yourself off the hook and try again. I ended this, the show notes with practice makes progress in this game, but only if you understand why you're doing this and why you're struggling. These are the two reasons why. 
All right, so this is episode 190 of The Anxious Truth. We'll wrap it up now. I appreciate you guys coming and checking it out. I'm going to play you out with the song Afterglow. Here it is. By my buddy Ben Drake. You can find Ben Drake and his music at bendrakemusic.com. That's the song you hear at the beginning and end of every podcast episode. He's a good dude, and he's a good musician. Go check him out. If you are listening to this podcast on iTunes or Spotify or someplace where you can rate and review, leave us a five-star rating and then write a review because it helps other people find the podcast. If you're watching on my YouTube channel, like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you know when I upload again. And I think that's it, guys. I appreciate you coming by. I hope this has been helpful to you. We'll be back next week with another topic, whatever that happens to be. If you, you want, want to find, find all of my other, other stuff, my books, books and all my other social media stuff, just go to my website at theanxioustruth.com. And if you're digging the work and you want to find some way to support it, you can find ways to do that. Maybe buying my books or buying some merchandise or making a donation. You can go to theanxioustruth.com slash support and check it out. Not required. Always appreciated. Thank you guys for coming by. I will see you again next week. I hope this has been helpful. And remember, as I always say, this is the way. Feeling that you're gonna win. Yeah, you're doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast. No looking back or dwelling on the past. You know you'll never get another chance.